Thank you for joining us today for this webinar that is co-sponsored by the New Jersey MEP and, and Firestorm. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us today. Uh, just a couple of items of business. All attendees are on mute during the, the broadcast. If you have questions that arise, please use the question facility built in to go to webinar, and uh, we will try to get to those questions. We will also be contacting all of you after the webinar is over to uh, handle any individual questions or problems that you may have. Okay. Our moderators today, and we're glad to have Joe Cardenudo of the, uh, the New Jersey MEP, and our principal, our local principal in, uh, in New Jersey, Blair Neville. Uh, Blair, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and Joe a little bit here? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I, again, my name is Blair Neville. I am the um, principal here in New Jersey, and I work specifically with, uh, with NJMP. And uh, together, we've, we've put together a, a program to uh, address uh, business continuity and uh, some sort of preparedness needs of the manufacturers in New Jersey. And uh, part of that effort was um, this, this series of seminars that we're going to put on. Today's the first one. And again, I want to thank everyone for their attendance. But this is the first of hopefully six that we're going to put on over the next six months and focus primarily on business continuity, preparedness, and the, uh, the educational needs wrapped around those things. And they're in support of NJMEP's preparedness effort and their program to, to drive this culture of preparedness out through the manufacturers in New Jersey. So uh, hopefully today this will be informative and we'll have an opportunity for you to ask any questions through the web and we'll see if we can address them. And thank you, Blair. If any of you want to use Twitter, uh, we are following the hashtag on this, which is pound FS crisis. We do uh, follow Twitter on all of our webinars, so if you want to join us for other webinars, we would be delighted to have you with us. Today we're going to be discussing the, uh, the Crisis Coach webinar series, as Blair mentioned. And today's session is Five Common Failures in a Crisis. Joe? Um, uh, this is Joe Caratanuto. Um, NJMEP actually has um, organized this um, program in partnership with uh, Firestorm in an effort to um, respond to requests from manufacturers in the state of New Jersey to uh, really try to reduce their risks. When it comes to disasters like this, obviously after Superstorm Sandy, um, this became uh, a hot issue. Uh, many of you are familiar with NJMEP, but just to kind of give a quick uh, rundown, uh, our focus is really to address the needs of manufacturers in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we try to do that through helping them become more profitable, more efficient, and more globally competitive. And we do it through a, a host of different services that uh, can range from you know, process improvement to Lean Six Sigma, uh, business development, uh, strategic planning, and obviously helping uh, manufacturers reduce uh, risk, which obviously is one of the reasons for uh, this webinar. So uh, NJMEP is um, committed to working with manufacturers in the state, and we do that jointly uh, through Firestorm. Um, with efforts like this one to help educate uh, manufacturers in the state. Thank you, Joe. As, uh, as our attorneys tell us, and uh, our presenter today is an attorney, so we have to be careful here, this presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. Any work products provided by Firestorm must be read in conjunction with all guidance given by national, regional, local authorities, as well as your company's personal counsel. In other words, we are not giving legal advice or opinion today. Firestorm is noted for transforming crisis into value. Crisis will be, we can empower you to manage your risk and crises. Every organization is going to encounter rough spots in the road, and it's how we respond to them that makes the difference. Firestorm's expertise is in crisis management, critical decision support, 
crisis communication. Our presenter today is Harry Rulin, our chairman of the board of, uh, of the Firestorm. Harry's background is legal. Uh, he spent the first 18 years of his career as the insurance industry, as chairman and CEO of a publicly held insurance holding corporation. He has an extensive uh, background in crisis management. Uh, he has uh, worked extensively directly with clients, and he knows his business, and he knows the business world and the legal ramifications. On to you, Harry. Thanks, Bill, and thank you, everybody else, for being on the call this morning. You know, one of the things we've started doing recently in our seminars and webinars is talking to people a little bit before we get started. We do a Firestorm update of some of the most recent things that have been going on around the globe because I think a lot of them impact uh, the people who are listening in on the webinars. So uh, Joe just mentioned, for example, uh, Super, Storm, Super Storm Sandy. Um, obviously, that was a huge impact on the people of New Jersey, the, the manufacturers, and the whole East Coast. So looking forward at those type of events is very important in terms of people's preparedness and planning. I think it would be pretty uh, difficult to uh, talk today without recognizing that tomorrow is 9-11. Um, I think we need to recognize that as much for uh, the, the past and the people who sacrificed themselves on that day as we do looking forward to understand that certainly by no stretch of the imagination is the United States immune from the effects of violence and terrorism. Um, and a little further down on the list, obviously, you can see uh, a little discussion of Syria. And uh, when I get down to that point, we can talk a little bit about how uh, the discussions, negotiations, and uh, other things that are going on uh, could have an effect here in the United States. But before I get to that, um, Firestorm does risk-based analysis for organizations. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of is communicable illness planning and training. And for the most part, people tend to turn a deaf ear to communicable illness planning. Um, what organizations don't necessar necessarily think about is that the way in which they run their company, the way in which they train their employees, can have a big impact from ordinary things like the common A and B flu which does kill about 30,000 people in the United States every year, but it causes billions of dollars in loss uh, from people not coming to work. Uh, but it doesn't need to be big global things like flu. It can also be things like what you saw occur recently in that large Texas megachurch where they had a huge outbreak of measles. Um, so it's important for organizations, especially ones where people come in contact regularly or physically with one another, uh, that you have communicable illness planning in as part of your business continuity plan. Um, also interesting, I, I don't know whether you saw uh, uh, Janet Napolitano just moved from uh, her previous job and in, when leaving said that there were no 100% guarantees that the warnings of a serious cyber attack were real and that it could have a dramatic impact on commerce in the United States. I think all of us need to be looking at our systems within our companies, determining what kind of backup do we have that is not, and I stress, is not dependent on access to the Internet. If what uh, Napolitano was saying is, turns out to be correct, we need to understand how much of our infrastructure is standalone, how much of it is truly not reliant on being able to communicate with any other organization outside of the four walls of our building. So that's an interesting analysis that I think everybody should be looking at. Going back to Hurricane Sandy, I think you know, talking about hurricane season, uh, right now, we're right in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, we're coming up towards the end of it, and nothing's happened. And I think what that's caused is a tremendous amount of apathy. I think people want to believe that what occurred last year was an anomaly, and therefore 
in their lifetime, they don't have to expect it or deal with it again. I think any of us uh, in the insurance industry uh, could have told you that that's not realistic. Uh, the East Coast is certainly prone to these kind of things. We've not seen them come with great regularity, but with the warming of the uh, Atlantic and the surface temperatures going up, there is no question that other large storms will be generated. Now, is it going to happen this year? Don't know. Uh, but can we, do we know for sure it's going to happen? Absolutely. And therefore, it would not only be negligent not to plan for it, but as officers and directors of companies, I think we have an obligation to our shareholders, our owners, our employees, our communities to prepare for it in the best way that we can. And there are some major, major things you can do, both in terms of preparedness so that you don't incur the damages, but also in terms of making sure that you can get back up and running more quickly than your competitors, therefore establishing a competitive advantage and making it so that you thrive when they may not. So that's the kind of stuff that I know Blair would love to talk to all of you about. And I would, you know, he's going to talk to you a little further on in the presentation about the uh, assessment that he would like to do with you. And I think it's very important that all of you take advantage of that assessment. Um, you know, another thing that we've seen a lot of and that Firestorm does a lot of work on is school violence. Uh, you saw recently that the, in Texas there was actually a death and injuries in a school from stabbing. Um, we typically think of school violence as gun violence and of course there was a tremendous amount of news last year where the whole gun control issue became front and center because of what took place in Sandy Hook. Um, Violence does not have to take the form of gun violence. As we saw in Oklahoma City with the McMurrow building, it can be bombings. It can be um, stabbings, as we saw in Texas. It can be gun violence. I think we need to be prepared, and I'll talk a little bit further on in the presentation about workplace violence, but it is a very real and significant issue. Now, the Syria thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about because I found the developments in the last few days to be very interesting. The fact that Russia, which you could view in some ways as a competitor, um, if you look at this from a uh, standpoint of uh, any of the manufacturers on this, on this call, if you were in the midst of a negotiation or you were in the midst of a merger or an acquisition or you were trying to get a large new customer, having a competitor step in and do something unexpected like Russia did yesterday where they essentially attempted a diplomatic solution, my guess is that that diplomatic solution was intended to discredit the United States and the, and the vote that was going to take place in Congress. But I don't think that anyone was prepared for it. And I think as part of the analysis that you'll do with Blair, if you get more into the business continuity planning process, when you start doing business impact analysis and looking at the different uh, situations that could affect your organization, those are the kind of things we want to identify in advance and be prepared for because then our response is not going to be a knee-jerk reaction. It's going to be a response that was well thought through and that has a plan in place to monitor the effects so that we can always know what our next step is and stay that one step ahead. Um, Another thing that I think you've seen happening around the United States, especially out in California, is wildfires. Now, I'm speaking to you from Colorado, um, where I run Firestorm's Colorado office. But I can tell you that fire, wildfire is a huge issue out here. One of the things that, again, I think a lot of the municipalities and others in California did not think through was the business impact analysis of what happens when there's a fire that shuts down our access to electricity, to water, to other things. So again, I think doing comprehensive vulnerability and threat analysis, which is not an overly difficult process, can allow you to identify exposures that you have and what you're going to do to deal with them. You don't know when they're going to happen, but you know that they can, and therefore you can plan for them. So with all that being said, I'm going to move on from the update. Um, 
I know you all tuned in today to listen to the five common failures in a crisis. These are five common failures that we have found not only in dealing with crises, but in dealing with the planning that organizations do for those crises. Uh, the, the first one that we're going to talk about is failure to control critical supply chains. I know everyone on this call takes that issue very seriously, because in the manufacturing space, controlling critical supply chains is essential. But there's some questions I want to ask all of you when I get a little further on, and I want you to think really hard about your critical supply chain, because just because you have a critical supply chain manager doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have critical supply chain exposure. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I want to talk to you about the value of training your employees both for on your plan at home or at work as well as for what they're doing in their own homes. Um, Again, going back to what I was just speaking of a minute ago, identifying and monitoring all of the threats and risks, knowing what they are so you're not overlooking something. Um, you know, the number of companies that overlooked their weather exposure last year prior to Hurricane Sandy, and the number of them that are currently overlooking it again because they want to be in denial about the fact that this is something they have to plan for, um, we can talk about that as well. Um, one of the things that is essential absolutely essential to making sure that your plan is going to work is conducting exercises and updating the plan based on the results that you get from those exercises, similarly updating your plans as a result of occurrences such as Hurricane Sandy or anything else that might take place within your organization. And then having a detailed crisis communication plan, knowing who's going to say what to whom, when they're going to say it, who's authorized to make the releases, who's not authorized to speak, all of those kind of things. You've got to know who the constituents are, because obviously the message that you're going to give to OSHA is very different than the message that you're going to give to your shareholders. You need to be very clear. You need to be very transparent. This cannot be done at the time that something occurs. So having an OSHA strategy and plan in place is something you need to have and you need to understand the rules, the laws. I mean, it all needs to be documented very clearly. So again, we'll talk about that a little further on. I want to talk to you about the controlling of critical supply chains. I know most, if not all of you who are on this call today, understand that the ability to get the raw materials you need, or if you are a component manufacturer, the ability to get your product to your customer is essential for your survival. One of the things we had happen recently with a manufacturer, uh, they were making a critical part for a guidance system for the military. And they had done their critical supply chain analysis. And they had made sure they had multiple suppliers for each component part. What they hadn't done was go through and analyze the critical supply chains of their suppliers. And what we found was that their redundant suppliers were actually receiving their critical materials from the same party. So there was actually a bottleneck that looked sort of like an hourglass. You know, they had their critical supply chain fairly well anal analyzed, but they didn't pay attention to the fact that it necked down and that there was a choke point. And that that choke point was extremely sensitive to weather-related issues, hurricane being the main issue because it was a coastally exposed uh, supplier. So when you're doing your critical supply chain analysis and when you're doing your business continuity planning, you need to be sending out questionnaires to your suppliers, making sure that you understand how and where they're getting their product from. One of the major critical supply chain issues that Firestorm worked on a few years ago uh, was caused by a hurricane hitting the port in Louisiana. And what it did was it shut down the ability of an East Coast manufacturer to get the raw material that they needed in order to produce plastic bottles. 
their main purchaser was one of the large soda drink manufacturers. And that company, when they were told that the supply of bottles would be interrupted, went to Asia and sourced bottles from another company. They found that those bottles were inferior in quality, but when they did focus groups with the customers, they found out that nobody really cared. You know, I drink my soda, I throw the bottle into the recycling, I don't really care about the bottle. And what happened was this company went from being the sole source provider to that particular company to being one of three. And being one of three didn't give them enough revenue to continue in operation, and this company ceased to exist as a result of the fact that they didn't understand that they were exposed to hurricane risk, which they never understood because of the way in which they did their supply chain analysis. So what we would like to help all of you do is analyze your critical supply chain, look at the work that your head of supply has done, help that individual look good. One of the things about Firestorm we want you all to understand, our goal is to make you look good. We are never going to review your plans or do any analysis and make you look bad. We're never going to say, why the heck did you, know, did you do this or why didn't you do that? We're, the, the worst thing we might ever say is that the plan that you've put together has some, uh, there, we see some opportunity to improve certain sections. You know, and, we would, and one thing we will also never do is we will never put anything in writing before you have an opportunity to understand what that's going to be verbally. Because we don't want to embarrass or in any way affect the credibility of any of our customers. So be sure that our, whole, our purpose is to help and to make you guys look good. Another failure in the, in the process is training employees both at work and at home. If your employees don't have a plan at home, if they don't know what their hurricane plan is, they don't know what their wildfire plan is, be sure that when that happens, they will not come to work. Home trumps work every time, no question. And they won't be there. Clearly, if they're not there, there is no opportunity to implement the corporate plan. Because we can't implement the corporate plan if our employees aren't there. Similarly, if we haven't trained them, if they don't know what the plan is, even if they are there when something goes wrong, they're not going to know what to do. Similarly, if you haven't followed a policy of cross-training where every critical function has two backups, you can be sure that the individual you need to run that particular piece of equipment won't be there and their backup will be on vacation. You need more than one backup for critical jobs. So going back to the issue, and, uh, and, and we'll get to that in a second, of um, doing test exercises, one of the things I'm going to advise you to do after you've trained all of your employees is be ready to do test exercises where you remove critical employees from the exercise, because that's going to tell you where your holes are. One of the things about training employees for home and work, 70% of employers already admit that they, don't, they, that they have not done that. 70% of their people are not trained. And imagine a football team trying to get the ball across the goal line where 70% of the people on the field don't know what the play plan is. I think we all know what the outcome of that is going to be. Um, we wrote a book called Disaster Ready People for a Disaster Ready America. It's a book that uh, many manufacturers and other organizations have purchased for all of their people. Instead of it saying Firestorm there at the bottom, they've actually branded it with their own corporate brand and put a forward in it from their uh, senior management This and encouraged their people. It's basically, it's a 12-step plan, 13 now that we've added pets to the back, uh, that tells you how to develop an emergency plan for your family. If you've got a plan for your family, the likelihood is you're coming to work. And that's how we make a more resilient organization. So I would very much advise all of you to talk to Blair, uh, talk to Joe, get these books for all of your employees, and 
continually reinforce that you support them in developing those plans. Some organizations have even gone to the extent of putting chapters uh, one at a time on their intranet and reminding people, hey, you need to be doing chapter one this month, you need to be doing chapter two next month, so that at the end of a year, you've gone through all 12 chapters. Um, very much worth doing if you want to make your organization stronger. You know, identifying all the threats, monitoring all of the threats and risks. I'm going to show you a little further on what a form might look like that you could use for doing something like that. But when you talk about things like hurricanes, is there any chance that your factory is coastally exposed? Is it flooding exposed? We had one factory that we looked at that had a first floor that if the one sump pump failed, the first floor would flood within a matter of hours. No backup to the pump, no emergency electric to the pump. Very simple to put a second pump in the well and very simple to have the generator connected to that circuit. So now at least we know, no matter what, we've got a chance of keeping the first floor from flooding. Similarly, if we know the first floor is subject to flooding and we've got pumps, machinery, whatever else that if it gets wet is going to need to be rebuilt, we should absolutely know who's going to rebuild them, where are those factories, make sure we've got contracts in place so that we're the first ones to get our pumps pulled, get them sent in, get them back, so we're back in business before our competitors. It's all of that kind of thinking, having that kind of strategy that's going to make a big difference in a, a real crisis situation. Part of that, of course, is doing complete vulnerability and risk analysis, knowing you know, wh which are those activities or which are the, the uh, vulnerabilities that are going to occur that are certain. So you see across the bottom of that one chart on the left there, um, there's a lot of things. We know they're going to be slip and falls. We know, hopefully, we're, we're going to avoid as many industrial accidents as possible, but there's going to be a certain number of them. And we're going to deal with those in the normal course of operations. But anything where we have high certainty and high impact, well, obviously, those we, we have to plan for. Um, it's the ones that tend to have high impact but low certainty uh, that people tend to avoid. I used to use the example of a meteor striking the Earth. And I said, you know, not a lot of people are going to plan for a meteor striking the Earth. Unfortunately, of course, last year we had a meteor strike the Earth. And those folks up there in Russia uh, who experienced it, I think, would tell you that having a meteor plan may not be such a bad idea. So uh, I certainly am not advising that to the New Jersey manufacturers. But I think most of the planning that we would do for the other uh, hazards will uh, be implemented in the event of a meteor. <laughs> so um, we can talk more about that if anybody has meteor questions. Again, going back to identifying and uh, monitoring all of the risks and threats, you definitely want to know what they are. You want to have them to the great ex greatest extent possible listed. You want to update the list on a regular basis. Um, Blair can definitely help you with this. Also, Bill Baker, who's on the phone, uh, has a very strong knowledge of this hazard impact matrix form which I'm sure if uh, Blair wants to get Bill involved in some of those things as well. You know, we've got great resources uh, at Firestorm for doing this kind of thing. So one of the things that we've added to the form recently, I mean, if you had looked at what we were doing five years ago, social media risk would not have been on the list. Social media risk is now huge. It is absolutely gigantic in terms of rep rep <laughs> reputation and brand management. Um, so th there is no organization that now is not subject to social media risk, to their customers being uh, directly contacted, to their, uh, all of their employees and everyone else in their chain being impacted and the message being controlled and delivered by someone outside of our organizations. So, Understanding social media, having a social media risk plan is essential at this point to every organization. Every customer you have 
is out there. They're using the internet. They're searching. They're getting information about your company, and we need to make sure that they're getting it from you the way you want it to be delivered. We've already talked a little bit about communicable illness. You know, we had a pandemic a couple of years ago. Fortunately for all of us, it was an H1N1 pandemic, which was very mild in terms of severity, although I will tell you 100,000 people in the United States died as a result of the H1N1 or complications from it. So it was not inconsequential, certainly not the millions that we saw from the Spanish flu worldwide or the several you know, 100,000 within the United States. But the H5N1 is still out there. There's a new H7N9. There are all kinds of drug-resistant forms of various diseases, such as tuberculosis. Uh, they now call Africa and some of those developing nations over there melting pots for virus, because antibiotics are available on the street, no prescription. And what happens is people take the dose only until they feel better. They don't go through the full regime. So what they're creating is drug-resistant forms of various bacteria, which uh, can be very dangerous. So for those of you who have customers or part of your supply chain that goes through some of these either third world or developing countries, you need to be very tuned in to how you're handling materials that come from those areas. Um, what they have found is that some of these viruses and bacteria can live for up to seven days in spittle or some piece of phlegm that might be on a product or document. So all of those things need to be part of your communicable illness plan. Uh, your people need to understand what your cleaning protocols are. They need to know what you're using in terms of product for cleaning. Um, all of these things can have a dramatic effect. Imagine the effect on your organization if you had a communicable illness specific to your company and it got out on social media that you were the cause of spreading that particular disease. Obviously, the reputation and brand impact could be dramatic. Workplace violence is something that every single organization in the United States needs to be aware of. Every day, statistically, literally every day, somebody dies in the workplace from workplace violence. On an annual basis, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 500 deaths a year. Many of the deaths are as a result of gun violence. Most of them are as a result of poor practices for hiring, firing, or discipline. And the way in which those things are handled is extraordinarily important. If there are any women on the call, uh, which I'm sure there are, death in the workplace for women comes about more frequently as a result of spousal or boyfriend problems. And I've spe I, I really single out women in this situation because it does not happen in the reverse. Women do not come into the workplace and shoot their husbands, um, though sometimes it may be justified. Uh, it, no, that was speaking for me personally. Um, but no, obviously it's not something to make light of. The um, risk to females in the workplace is very high. If you have a high proportion of women in the workplace, um, I think it is absolutely important to understand that this is one of the vulnerabilities or exposures that you have and it needs to be incorporated into your workplace violence plan. Um, one of the things that's very important here and that we advise all uh, manufacturers to have, uh, all organizations to have, and that Blair can work with you on, uh, as can Joe, is having an anonymous reporting process within your organization. So if you know that a particular uh, coworker of yours is having problems with their spouse or with their boyfriend, and they've let you know that, there needs to be a process and a procedure within the organization where an employee can comfortably report that to human resources or whatever other entity you believe is the correct one so that the organization is on notice, so that when 
Harry Rulin does show up to your workplace looking for his wife, you know that there is potentially a problem. Um, if you didn't know, you might otherwise let that individual have access to your facility. And of course, we've all seen on television what the outcome of those situations can be. So I, I very much strongly recommend uh, that you talk to uh, Blair as, a, as part of your overall vulnerability and threat analysis. Um, what, you need to talk about what your workplace violence plan looks like. As you can see on the screen, uh, we have a workplace violence toolkit that will walk you through a lot of what needs to be in your workplace violence planning process. So again, it's, it's one of the things that every organization needs to be looking at. So one of the questions we get regularly from people is, OK, what, how do we do this? What's the process? Firestorm follows a very simple process. Predict, plan, perform. So on the predict side, as we've been talking about, know what your vulnerabilities are. And that's a process that you can go through. I can guarantee you everybody on this call knows their organization better than almost anyone. And if we sit down in a room and we walk through what all the vulnerabilities and exposures are and list them, you guys know exactly what they all are, or someone in your organization does. So by the way, that sump pump in that factory, the guy who recognized that as a vulnerability was the maintenance person within that company. So when you do your business impact analysis, make sure that you're utilizing all of the resources within your organization. Make sure that you go down to the lowest level and up to the highest level, because obviously the type of thing that your CEO is going to identify may be shareholder or regulatory related, and it could have nothing to do with that sump pump in the basement. It's very important when you're doing those analysis to take all those things into account. Similarly, when you get to the planning process, we want to develop plans for operational issues like the sump pump for tactical issues such as what 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 maybe how we're going to deliver uh, our product in the event of a hurricane or some other uh, situation that restricts our delivery and again it could be something strategic where we're looking long term you know what is it how are we going to merge or acquire our competitors so that we can have a bigger competitive advantage i mean again you got to remember the risk management process that you want to go through doesn't only take into account those things that are negative, like a hurricane. They are those things that are risk-based that could be positive as well, like a merger or an acquisition. Um, and then the last stage is in terms of perform. You've got to be able to actually implement the plans that you develop. You've got to do that training and testing like we've talked about, because the only way you're going to know whether those things work is to make sure you're testing them on a regular basis. So oh, there you go. Again, talking about conducting exercises and updating the plan. I mean, that is absolutely part of your strategy. And you guys are doing this every day. I mean, to some degree, when something goes wrong in your plant or in your uh, warehouse or wherever it might be, you put in place a fix because you don't want it to happen again. The problem with that is you hadn't identified that exposure to begin with, and the fix has not necessarily been documented. So that when the individual who's supposed to know what the fix is either isn't there or retires or moves to another job, you lose that institutional knowledge. And that's another thing you guys need to be paying a lot of attention to. Uh, we just had this happen with one of our coal mine customers where their head of operations retired and what they realized was he took with him a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge that they needed. Now luckily for them, we were able to resurrect that situation and we've captured most of that information uh, from him. He was happy to participate. But you need to be doing it as it happens because you don't necessarily know uh, you know, if I had stepped off the curb yesterday and got hit by a bus, there's no way to, re to resurrect that situation.
so when you're conducting your plans, you know, you need to do real planning so that you can develop exercises that simulate real world situations. You know, so when we do it, we actually lay out the situation and then we give it to you in pieces. You know, we say, okay, your main office building sustained a direct hit from whatever it might be, the hurricane, a fire, whatever you think is a reasonable scenario because you want your employees to be enacting an exercise that they feel is real because otherwise they're not going to take it seriously. But as you go through the various stages and steps, everyone is learning. Someone in every test exercise is taking notes. They're making sure that they gather the information so that it can be used and it can be incorporated into the planning process. Because the planning process is really a circle. Because after the plan and after the test, there's things that have been learned that then go back into the vulnerability and threat analysis and get, go back into the plan. So again, this is something that Blair is an expert at, and he's more than happy to work with all of you on it. I think that you know one of the things we talk about regularly are what are some of the, the failures that we've seen in the media and otherwise. I think you'll all recall from uh, what took place uh, in the Gulf, uh, BP wishes that they had conducted exercises, that their crisis communication plan had been a little bit different that they had done some media training for their senior executives. Um, those kind of things only happen if you have a discipline about your business continuity process and you have done everything you can to avoid the five common failures. I mean, you definitely want to have a detailed crisis communications plan so that when you have 20 microphones and 20 TV cameras pointed at you, you know what you're going to say. As importantly, you know what you're not going to say. And probably the most important, you know how to say it. Because I can say many things, such as no comment. No comment tells everybody I'm hiding something and I'm really uh, not being transparent in my communication. Whereas if I say, we are in the process of investigating the situation. As soon as we have more information, we will share it if, if possible. S same exact thing. I just said no comment. But I said it in a very different way where if I'm trained properly, the message as it comes across is not that I'm trying to hide anything, but that I'm not going to divulge information until I know that it's factual. And there are ways of doing that type of training. One of the things I would encourage all of you um, do this in advance, do the training, do the exercises. But if you don't, or if you know one of your uh, partner companies or, or, or customers or anyone else you work with, if they get themselves into some type of a crisis before they start making the kind of mistakes that we've seen in the media on a regular basis, call us. Call Blair, uh, call Firestorm, call, get an expert involved because it will make all the difference. Be careful about getting public relations firms involved if they don't have some type of a specialty in crisis public relations because it's very different talking in peacetime versus what you say in a crisis. Um, so one of the things we look at is reputation management, is brand management, what I call consequence management. Because very often the crisis itself is over. The fire has been put out. The, whatever the major issue that occurred. And what we're trying to do is manage the consequences down the road. So think about that when you're looking at the situations you're involved in. Because often we want to explain away the crisis that occurred or try and manipulate the information in a way that we think we can control the message, as opposed to looking long term at what is the impact on all of our different constituents. There is definitely an art to crisis communications, and we are prepared to share that with you. Um, again, so re reach out and, and take advantage of the assessment that you're being offered and the other tools that Blair has to, to share with you. Um, is that, that Harry? Yeah. 
Here, it just is, this is Blair. I just want to make a quick comment as we yeah, um, pers personally, um, just recently with someone I'm working with, uh, we had a uh, they had a small incident, um, not a crisis by any means. But I just want to mention that in the communication plan, it's not necessarily just the, the press and the and the media. It's also you have your internal uh, you you have your internal constituents as well. And you know the bottom line was that the executives who thought they were doing the right thing, the message didn't come across properly. So the end result was uh, significantly more time involved, a lot of drama, and um, a lot of wasted time and some serious costs involved with, with just the wrong message being communicated to their internal employees. And it was a learning experience for them that they realized that they're good at what they do, but, but speaking and communicating it wasn't what they're good at. So um, again, it's not always about the external. It can be just as important internally as well. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, Blair. And I think internally probably is much or more important. And you got to keep in mind also, in today's world, everybody that you communicate with, especially your employees, are publishers. Everybody carries in their pocket a Great phone point. that they have the ability to do Facebook, Twitter, as we talked about on the beginning of this call that we're doing you know, right now, that Firestorm is doing as a result with this webinar. Um, but anyone can videotape something in your factory. They can broadcast it. If you say something or put out a message that people perceive incorrectly, you have to be sure and assume that it is going to be on the internet almost instantaneously. So one of the things that Blair will do with you as part of your business continuity planning process is develop what we call message maps. So for each of the vulnerabilities that are identified, people will know what it is we want to say and how it is we want to say it. And appropriate people will be trained. So for example, we have done media training in numerous organizations where the CEO was the wrong person and, and acknowledged as such to get in front of the TV camera. Very uncomfortable talking in public, tremendously knowledgeable technically, tremendously knowledgeable about their business, but just was the wrong person. Turns out in that particular situation, it wasn't even the chief operating officer. It turned out to be the head of human resources who was their best spokesperson. We can train almost anyone. And one for any of you that have done speaking in public, you know if you're prepared, if you've been trained, if you know what the messages are, if you practice them, the level of anxiety goes down dramatically. So all of that is a very important part of the process. The pictures that you're looking at um, right now on the computer, uh, and actually I don't know if you were able to see the one that just went by because the computer automatically turns them. Um, it was a picture of Jim Satterfield, who's the, the president of Firestorm, walking uh, on the Virginia Tech campus after the shootings. Um, we were called in to help them handle the crisis management and media for that situation. And of course, that was a crisis situation where there was no particular media plan in place. So one of the things we had to do, and you see this sign that's on the door, um, we created these signs and put them up. And interestingly, the media actually very much respected these signs. If any building that didn't have one, they felt free to walk in. So another thing you need to be aware of as part of your crisis communications plan is knowing how you're going to control your facility. One of the things that is happening to a couple of our customers right now, actually, um, they are in the media. And they've got stories going on about their organizations. And the media comes to their facility because they want to shoot what they call B-roll footage. They want something to roll behind the story as they're talking about it. You do not need to grant access to the media to your facility ever. They, you don't work for them. And if you understand how to manage them, there's a much higher likelihood of a positive outcome. So again, if anyone you know is in this kind of a situation where the media is approaching them, get Blair involved, get you know the NJMEP involved, call them and ask for assistance because this is an area of expertise 
that most organizations do not have residents within their company. Take advantage of the services that you have available to you because the outcome will be significantly different. You know, you heard me mention earlier the concept of disaster denial. And one of the problems that people have, organizations have, is what they don't understand is today, unlike in the past, most things are foreseeable. I mean, because of the amount of information that we're subject to, we can pretty much analyze any situation and know what the vulnerabilities are. We may not know when, but we know that they can happen. And the biggest problem that you've got with that, because things are foreseeable, anyone can be found accountable. And I think that that's one of the things that you're going to see, is that if you haven't done your vulnerability and threat analysis, and you haven't identified the exposures that your company has, and then something does occur, someone is going to ask, well, what do you mean you didn't know that that could happen? And maybe, you know, look, there's always, like the meteor striking the earth that we talked about earlier, there's always going to be those kind of situations that just literally come out of the blue. Um, but if we have good planning in place, as I said, you know, your meteor plan probably between your fire plan and your hurricane plan, you probably have most of your media, your meteor plan covered. So it's only in those situations where you haven't done anything that you're going to get the real criticism. Um, I'm going to I'm going to skip over most of what of this case study because we're almost at the end of our hour, and I want to leave some room for questions. But I did want to point out to you, you know, when we talk about social media, I don't know how many of you saw this progressive story. Um, progressive Insurance Company uh, denied a claim to a woman who was killed in an accident. Um, her policy had a, a underinsured motorist clause within it. And what that does when you have underinsured motorist coverage is it provides coverage as though that person were insured by Progressive. Um, so what happened was, because they had to provide the individual that killed this particular woman with coverage because they, that individual was underinsured, Progressive wound up insuring or providing coverage to the individual that killed the woman. So they denied the claim to the woman and then defended the individual that killed her. Obviously, what, was, what became of this was a tremendous social media nightmare because it was very poorly managed by Progressive. It blew up on the internet because the brother put out a Tumblr post and it became Facebook posts and it was tweeted and retweeted and it became a situation where Progressive couldn't manage it. They got to the point where so many people were talking about it, it was the number one hit whenever you Googled progressive insurance. And what they realized was, we need to get out of this because otherwise it's going to consume us. So they paid the claim, to the, they settled with the family and paid the claim because they didn't have an adequate policy in place for managing their message and managing their social media. They didn't have in place appropriate spokespeople to understand what to do in situations like this. Be sure they now do, um, but it's, uh, it's a situation that every one of the companies on this call needs to be aware of to varying degrees depending on um, what your customer base looks like. You have social media exposure. And I think, Blair, with that, I'm going to uh, end my comments, let mm -hmm. you talk about uh, a little bit, if you'd like, about the self-assessment, and then uh, we can take some questions. Sure, sure. Thanks, Harry. Um, what you see in front of you now is a just a, a uh, picture of a uh, cover of a, what we call our self-assessment. You'll hear us use business uh, self-assessment, uh, business continuity self-assessment. Generally what it is is we've, we've gone out over a number of years and created a, a assessment model based on um, a number of criteria in the industry. And what the model does is it allows us to 
um, collect some information on your company. There's a set of 55 questions, really centered around a business continuity plan, and um, you know, in, in the purpose of it is to get an understanding of the state of your current plan, some areas that uh, you're currently working on, and if you see in the photograph or the picture in the, on the slide, it, it, the end result is a graph, graphical model that shows you where you stand against a set of standards. And the real key to this is two things. One is it allows us as, as a company to gain a lot of information about your business and help you understand where some of your, some of your risk profile lies. And also, it puts you in a position where you know where to start and help you with an idea of where do I start. And it gives you a good indication of uh, the areas that uh, you know, need, need to be worked on. So again, it, it, we've working with NJMEP, traditionally we would go out, probably spend uh, an hour, hour and a half talking through a number of people. We can do it. I've done a number of these over the phone with the right people in the room. And traditionally it's about, uh, you know, it's about a $1,500 value, which uh, we provide a, a fairly substantial report with it. And because of our relationship with NG, NJMEP and the, uh, you know, the, their commitment to you as, as their clients, we're willing to, to talk to any of their customers and provide this report for them at, at a no, you know, no charge. So again, it takes about an hour, hour and a half, um, and the report gives you a, a very refined picture of what your business continuity plan or situation is. And for those of you who don't have a plan and you would think that there's a lot of no's on it, which is, is true, um, it does paint a picture of where you need to start in some of the areas that uh, you know, would be your first step in the process. And as part of our commitment to NGMEP, we're willing to work with, with any, one of them, any one of you to, to do this. And uh, we can answer some questions on it, or uh, afterwards, uh, you, know, you can uh, touch base with uh, your NJMEP account manager um, to arrange a, a quick conversation with us. Or if you don't know the account manager, just come into their office, and um, they'll get you to the right person. We can talk about you know about the plan and doing the self-assessment, and also just generally about your questions if you if you want to. Uh, Take this to the, the next step. Joe, is there anything you want to add? Um, well, we may be waiting sure. for some questions. Um, I can provide um, information. If you prefer, you can actually call our New Jersey office in Morris Plains and speak to Kathleen Baldwin. She'll connect you with the account manager for your area. Uh, the phone number there is 973-998-9801. And um, we can have somebody from NJMEP and, and perhaps Firestorm as well. Uh, in this case, Blair, Blair, who's our local New Jersey uh, representative, uh, contact you and um, tell you more about the program as well as the uh, risk assessment. Okay, and uh, you know we're going to be doing a series of these uh, crisis coach workshops uh, with NJMEP. I think Bill. At this point, let's take questions if you have any. And obviously, we're coming up on the hour mark. If anyone needs to drop off, please you know, feel free to do that. Um, the, the questions that we've received are, you know, how do I get started? And I believe that Blair and Joe have already covered that one. And we've got a number of comments that are thanking you for a very fine webinar here. So. We're at the top of the hour. If you have any individual questions, we will be glad to follow up with you. Once again, this session has been recorded so that you can request a recording uh, through Firestorm. Thank you. We'll wrap it up now, and we appreciate your participation. We appreciate the cooperation and the sponsorship of the New Jersey MEP, and uh, we'll let you have your day back. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending.